Okay, I guess we might as well start. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, our presenter today is Lance Bravitt from MRB Group, and he's going to give a presentation on the innovations and best practices for planning and zoning boards. Lance? Uh, good afternoon. Thank you again for the opportunity to, to provide this presentation to everyone. Um, as mentioned, my name is Lance. Uh, been working with MRB Group for about 16 years. Uh, and during that time, I've been mainly uh, functioning as a planner per se and working with uh, municipal zoning boards and planning boards, uh, doing day-to-day uh, -day reviews, assisting them with uh, procedural requirements, environmental uh, seeker processes, um, and then the day-to-day -day activities where, where applicable. Um, so today's presentation is kind of be uh, uh, like a, an overview of planning board ZBA uh, actions. Uh, and then inside of that presentation, I hope to provide you guys with uh, some innovations and best practices that I feel I've learned along the way that might be able to be incorporated in your, in your procedures and processes as you guys uh, continue to go through reviews on your end. Uh, what is the role of a planning board? Oh, I apologize. Um, at any point in time, uh, during the presentation, if you guys have questions, I believe uh, I built in a couple spots during the presentation to, to try to answer those questions. And obviously, uh, at the very end of the, app, uh, of the presentation, we'll, we'll do some question and answers then too. So hopefully, if you have questions, please feel free to provide them and then we'll try to address them during the presentation. What is the role of the planning board? Um, planning board responsibilities. Uh, planning boards uh, roles to protect the communities where, where applicable, where, where we can. Uh, advisory role is, is through the comprehensive plan and development of a comprehensive plan. A lot of communities through that process get involved, all their local boards, specifically the planning board, to help them uh, come up with ideas um, and, and thoughts uh, as it relates to the comprehensive plan, being that that's the basis essentially uh, for a lot of the reviews that come before you. Uh, land use, which is a component, uh, both of the zoning codes, if you have a zoning code, and of the comprehensive plan. Uh, zoning changes, uh, any changes, uh, uses specifically as it relates to that help govern uh, the applications that we get through the review process. Also, area variance requests. I mean, I think this being obviously is more geared towards the ZBA, but these are, uh, planning board has an advisory role over those uh, those procedures and processes as it relates to uh, applications. Uh, the regulatory role, as you guys are aware, is review of the subdivision plans, um, powers assigned by the board, such as review of site plans at times. I know some communities uh, site plan is a, a recommendation and then the municipal the board actually does the actual approval of a site plan. Most communities that I work with, uh, the powers and duties of site plan review fall on the planning board. And then special use permits. Um, some communities, likewise, uh, the planning board uh, does all the review related to special use permit process, and some, uh, they do just the site plan component and the ZBA uh, does the review for the special use permit process. Application and considerations. Is the application complete? So, you know, a lot of the communities that I work with, and they all range from different types of sizes, uh, procedurally, most of them, have a staff in place that helps them through what I call the internal review process. And that is essentially what I'm gonna go over now, but ultimately they have somebody in position that helps them review to determine is the application complete? Um, do you have all the forms that are required to be completed? Completed? Are they signed off by the applicant? Have the fees been played? Does this comply with your local code? Does this need to go through a process that wasn't other, otherwise identified either internally or by the applicant as part of their application? Um, some of the communities that I work with uh, have the staff in place that does a lot of that review and then they send it to the, the, the associate boards. Some communities do not. You know, They have a part-time code enforcement officer or part-time zoning enforcement officer um, and they're just not there enough to either A, have the time to do this because when they are there, they're busy doing uh, the, the, the job that they're asked to do. And, and other times um, it's just, maybe it's just too much to handle. Um, procedurally, maybe there isn't enough time built into the application review process 
for them to provide that review. And we'll get into that a little bit as well. But basically, um, uh, this is where we begin the process. Applications get submitted. Somebody's in charge of doing that initial review. Who is it? And, and that's, I think, where some of these issues kind of result from is they, they either A, the person isn't identified, or B, you just don't have a good enough procedure in place, or C, there just isn't enough time um, built into your review process. So know the calendar. Is a hearing work required in, and when, excuse me, um, public hearings required for subdivisions, special use permit, area variances, use variances, zoning changes, but they also sometimes are required for site plans that depend upon uh, your local code. Is there any other action needed to be taken by a certain deadline? Um, you know, seeker has deadlines, subdivision has deadlines, public hearings has deadlines, um, referrals sometimes have deadlines. Is a county referral required and did the county respond? Um, a lot of times when we get an application, we try to determine a lot of these items up front before we begin that process, because um, I believe that helps uh, control where this, the applications are going and puts everybody on the same table. Application uh, ready for review. Um, so this is that internal process as I was adhering to, uh, re, uh, excuse me, um, alluding to. Um, an application comes in for review. Uh, is there a waiver? Some communities have some standards that allow the boards or the code enforcement officer in some instances to waive. Um, that review gets done internally and then is there interpretation needed? For example, can they go with every one of their applications that comes into them? They have a zoning officer there who does an interpretation of the application that has been submitted before it goes anywhere. They do an initial review, they do a determination, says, yep, this is where the code is applicable. They meet that code. Here's where it's got to go. It's got to go to the planning board because under a code, this is the subsection that requires them to do that. It's got to go to the ZBA because it needs variances per these code sections and then it references that code section. Does it need to go to the county? Yep, here's the reasons why it needs to go to the county. And then that zoning determination follows the application along the process. So it kind of identifies where it needs to go right away. Some communities rely on their boards to make that determination and that's fine as well. Um, but sometimes I feel like that's where uh, some of my, I think these, these practices that I've, I, I've seen along the way might be to help you guys through that. Uh, so that, because when it resides all on the boards and some of the communities that I feel are, are struggling through that process is because they're just not getting what, maybe what they should be getting along the way. Um, maybe the applications just aren't quite what they need to be. Um, and so that sometimes bottlenecks the process and it makes things more difficult. So uh, following a process like this, having somebody identified whom is responsible for making those calls to assist the boards and, and then backtracking from there. Do you have a process in place? Are your applications thorough? Are they getting you what you need? Are the boards getting uh, you know, an area variance application that's, that has everything? Um, those are the things where I think you can start with and then that'll help you guys better prepare um, for the processes as it comes to you with each of these boards. One of the tools is a calendar. Um, so I, a lot of the communities that I work with, a couple of them had this already in place, but then I started bringing this to other communities that we were working with. And it doesn't always work. It's not perfect, but it does have its role. And this particular one, um, you know, it identifies a due date. When are applications due? And I was identifying this earlier in the, in the presentation that, you know, what's the, the length of time an application is due before it goes to the planning board? Do you have enough time internally to even do a review to make a determination if the application is complete? And I, and I do the quotes because technically you want your boards making that determination because there's a time frame associated once an application is deemed complete. But you want an application to be as thorough and as complete as possible before it gets to your ZBA or your planning board. So this calendar um, is an idea, uh, one way that that can help provide a time frame that works not only internally, but also for the applicants because now they know what to expect. If I submitted an application to you guys for site plan and it needs variances, 
I, and I submit it to you on April 26th, the fourth column down. I know that I'm now eligible. Are you there, Leah? Sarah, can you still hear me? Yes, I can. Can you see my board, my presentation? Uh, no, I can't see your presentation right now. Going back to it. How about now? Yes. Not sure what just happened. Yeah, that was weird. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> okay. Sorry about that. I, I know I'm not sure what happened, but I'll continue. So the calendars, as I was stating, I think is one way that you can help your applications out. Um, where I've seen the benefit of this is these calendars get adopted by the municipal boards and then ultimately get put into your application so that if somebody has an area variance application inside of that application is a calendar. And then it takes that question and answer period out, specifically if you don't have the staff in place to address them. A lot of times communications, it gets broken down. I'm not sure what's happening, Sarah. I apologize if it's my end. Are you seeing my screen? Sarah, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. I can see your screen and I can hear you. All right. I had just gotten dropped. I apologize. I, I, again, audience, I do apologize for that if that's happening. I'm not quite sure what the issue is. I'm going to continue to, to try along the way. But if something comes up, please let Sarah know um, and then she can let me know. Um, referrals. Uh, when is an application and what referral requirements are there? Uh, adoption or amendment of a comprehensive plan, um, adoption of an amendment of a zoning ordinance or local law, issuance of special use permits, uh, approval of site plans, granting of use or area variances, other authorizations, um, which a referring body may issue under provisions of any zoning ordinance or local law has a referral requirement associated with it. This map, I know it's a little hard to see, Oh, this is the county referral map that we created for another community. And this is basically your, 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 your 100 foot from a property line or from a uh, neighboring community, um, 100 feet off a, a state or county road. Um, it just gives them a visual representation so that when they get an application and they identify the address on this map, they know that it has to go to the county just because of the location. And sometimes that helps. So maybe uh, the county might have a map very similar to this that you can use uh, for your community and that might help you. Um, uh, one of the items, and that's, that's what this, this present, this, um, excuse me, this is showing right here. This is basically the map 
Uh, this is the 500 foot municipal boundary, state park, recreation area, county state road map, uh, county stream drainage channel, county state land with public facility, a farm operation and ag district. That's what the map was kind of basically highlighting is these locations to make some of the location requirements easily identified for a staff member to see, yep, now it's required to go to county because this is where you're located. Some of the tools that we've seen also is, um, is we created a, a referral sheet. And so when an application comes in to the staff, there's a referral sheet that identifies anybody and everybody that that might need to go to. That referral sheet gets filled out internally and allows the staff to determine you know, because of these reasons, it's got to go to who? Uh, maybe you have a consulting firm that needs to review it. Maybe the county has to get it for uh, county referral requirements. Maybe you want to refer it to another board for a recommendation, like the planning board for the recommendation periods or the ZBA for other reasons. Um, maybe it's got to go to a, a DPW, uh, Department of Public Works uh, for water or sewer reasons. A referral sheet in the beginning sometimes helps with that so that it's not up to the planning board or ZBA during the review to make a determination. Well, did you talk to the DPW guy? No, I didn't, I didn't know I had to. Well, it should, that's waste another 45 days until you get comments back for them. Um, a referral sheet might help you with that up front so that you can identify if, if public water is required and there's a certain somebody that needs to review that whom you can identify then and make sure they get the package up front. Just a thought process. This flow chart here um, is basically outlining once an application gets to, in this case, your planning board. Um, is the applicant application subject to a preliminary review? If it is, it brings us to what that process may look like. A public hearing required. If it's a yes, the applicant and the county uh, planning board must be notified at least 10 days prior. Something, and in the newspaper, there's usually different requirements for newspaper, it might be five days prior. Um, sometimes it's more depending upon when the newspaper deadline is. Um, but the standard rule is usually like 15 days to get it to the newspaper, for the newspaper to be published, and then that gives notices out uh, to the public. If a public hearing is required, it must be held within 16 dates receipt of a completed application. Again, that's why I was doing the air quotes earlier about the staff making that determination. You don't want that time frame. Uh, on a subdivision where it's 62 days from the time you didn't complete or a public hearing requirement in this case to start when the application is received by staff. You want it to start when it comes to your board meetings. Um, and therefore, it's usually a good rule of thumb to have your board be the referring board that has to make that determination on whether or not an application is deemed complete or not. Then if it is and you have to hold the meeting does the application uh, sufficiently address the review criteria, your codes, your local laws, your staff comments, et cetera? And then within 62 days of holding that public hearing on a subdivision special use permit application, uh, transfer findings, decision for preliminary review, and then file your decision with the, clo uh, with the clerk's office and then move on to, in this case, final review. Or maybe there's only a, a one review stop shop for you guys. And therefore, as long as it gets done prior to that final decision, the same rules would apply. Um, in terms of, uh, I had a thought, I apologize. I'll, I'll wait till later to bring that up. <clears throat> what should a good say plan look like? Um, we've all seen different variations of plans. I'm sure it's probably more, more appropriately the ZBA just because with area variances, a lot of times a sketch plan is, is permitted, um, maybe written in code that way. I was referencing earlier, some of the tools would be to start by looking at your application criteria. Make sure as a board of the ZBA feels that you're getting information that's inadequate, that doesn't meet what you think you want it to meet and it makes it difficult for you guys to move forward review. Same with the planning board. Go back and look at your applications and see how thorough are they? What are you asking for? A lot of times I've seen some that just cite the code that just say, hey, refer to section X, Y, and Z and, and, and submit that information we're good. Well, that's good to some degree, but I think you, you really want it to be really clear, bold letters, identifying site plan application or special use permit application 
That way, when the applicant comes in, it's very easily identified. They know what they're grabbing. Inside of that, you want some clear directions. This is what you got to fill out in order to make whatever the board meeting dates are. And then sign it. You want them to be signed so they're held accountable for what they're submitted. Then in there, you probably want a checklist or two, depending upon the application. And as I was referring to the ZBA, very, very typically require a sketch plan. But a lot of times we get, we get a napkin plan um, that looks like this, that, that, that may not even have the dimensions on it. That just say, hey, I want, my, I want my, my shed in front of my house 10 feet off the property line, but how do you know where the property line is on a napkin plan? Uh, you want it to come back to you like on a, on a tax map at least, which they can get from the counties um, so that you can then at least know what that distance is and then go from there. Um, so a sketch plan with a checklist requirement of what you're looking for would be helpful. Again, my point to this was, is to look at your applications and make sure they're thorough. Make sure you're, you're getting what it is that you're asking for or you expect to see. And that only helps you guys through the review process. It makes it a little bit more thorough and it makes it more a little bit complete and it allows you guys to make decisions based on information that you're getting as opposed to requiring it later on and delaying applications if that has to happen. Another example is this, uh, is this plan has a little bit more information. Um, honestly, this is more in lines with a sketch plan that I'm typically accustomed to seeing. It doesn't have all the detail. It has a schematic layout of where things are located, but it doesn't have all the information that you would look, look for. This is more inclined to be your preliminary plan or your final plan. Um, this has the information, this has the detail, and it has the utility sizes. It gives us the information, it gives us dimensions. This is standard to what we typically require. A lot of communities that I work with honestly require this level at preliminary because preliminary has standing. So they make their preliminary checklist very intense and they want their applications to come in and be very thorough so that once they grant a preliminary approval, final doesn't have to change much other than the, than the terminology. I don't know that there's a right or wrong reason. It's all dependent upon where you are and what your code says, but that's, this is typically what I end up seeing for a preliminary review. Additional considerations, open and consistent communication with other boards, municipal offices, staff, public, and other information sources is essential. Um, boards need to utilize other boards and staff where applicable to help the process. Um, I think sometimes an applicant comes in and just wants to ramrod an application too because they don't either A, they don't believe that you guys know what you're doing and that's shame on them, um, or two, they just feel that They've done everything they need to do per your code and they want to go through. A lot of times uh, board members feel that pressure and they, they want to take action and you don't have to. Make sure you're getting what you want. If you feel that there's something that you need information from, use your staff, use the board, use other means to get that information so that you can make an educated decision on what's going and be able to stand behind it, whether it's an approval of a plan or a variance. No one knows everything about planning. No, nope, nobody does, but you have staff in place that should be enough. You have experts out there that can help you. The county is a great referral. Understanding know how to find out is an essential part of the thorough review process. Again, just utilizing the, the team that's there, your staff, the county, um, anybody that, that, that's on board with your community to help you come to an answer. Complete, create a complete and accurate public record. Now you guys are aware, uh, recordings and meeting minutes are important and required as part of the process. Just make sure you, you have good, accurate representation of what transpired from the board. Meetings support any decision with factual findings. Um, just make sure that, again, I, I go back to the applications being thorough. It just helps having a complete application so that when it comes time to make a decision, you have all the information in front of you. And then you use that to be your supporting information as to why you move forward with a variance or why you move forward with a preliminary plan approval. Um, Sarah, I don't know if you're available, but this is where I had some questions on the kind of like the planning board and application process. Um, I don't know if we have any questions you want to go through now or not. Uh, yes, we do have a question. Um, it is, are you saying that the decision by the ZBA would be made before the seeker determination? No, so 
So in no case can a decision be made before a seeker is done. Seeker is required to be done in every application prior to granting an, an approval of something. So CBA variances are typically type two. So if it's a, an application by itself, then meaning that if it's an area variance, let's say only, um, then the ZBA would be able to make the determination, classify the seeker, take the seeker, and then grant their approval of the variance. Likewise, with the planning board, if it's an unlisted action, they're able to make the seeker determination and then grant an approval of the project. If the project has multiple um, agencies involved in the process, meaning you have departments outside of the municipal staff that are required to grant an approval of the project, it's always a good idea to conduct a coordinated review if you want. That's up to the board. Unlisted actions, the planning board has the ability to, to take up an unlisted action and elevate it, not necessarily deem it a type one action, but elevate it to have to complete a full EIF. And then in doing so, can complete a coordinated review. You can complete a coordinated review on a short EIF as well, but a lot of times, if I'm dealing with an application that has outside agency reviews, DEC, Army Corps, a Department of Health, et cetera, if I'm dealing with that, a lot of times my thoughts would be, let's coordinate this out and get their input to help the boards make their decision. I mean, what better than to make your secret determination supported on actual documents provided to you from those agencies saying there is no impact on wetlands. There is no impact on sewer. I mean, having that information in front of you only helps you when you make your determination. Hope I answered it. I know I went a long way around, but hope I helped answer that. Um, I think that's the only one, right? Do you have another one, Sarah? Okay, okay. Thank you. I'll continue on the, the, the ZBA stuff. Uh, and planning board stuff, actually. Uh, special use permits. Um, the authorization of a particular land use that is permitted in the zoning law, subject to specific requirements that are imposed to assure that the proposed use is in harmony with the immediate neighbor and will not adversely affect the surrounding properties. That's just kind of defined what a special use permit typically is. Um, I think where I'm starting to see a lot of special use permit applications come in and involving both boards, and that's kind of what I want to hone in on right now, is with the solar project. I think we all have become accustomed to seeing solar applications, community solar, something in the range of five megawatts to 20 megawatts, which is coming through our local boards for review and approvals. And if you have a local law that's been adopted, it usually requires issuance of a special use permit and site plan approval. So on those processes, um, special use permit is really, is a, is a, is, has been contingent upon getting information from your planning board on the site plan application. And then also the ZBA on the special use permit information related to that. So that's where I'm starting to see a lot of communication between the two boards on one application um, due to the fact that it's a solar project that requires in most cases a special use permit. And public hearings and seeker that's usually a coordinated review. So it's a long process that usually takes multiple meetings and a lot of communities that I've been working with recently have started to bring both boards together and have a joint board meeting to eliminate the back and forth, the back and forth and having it together. Um, I know some communities uh, may not want that to occur and I think that's fine. I think do whatever your attorney and your local process requires, but if you have the ability to, it's not a bad idea to bring both boards together for the same project specifically if you have that type of a project. Um, special use permits, common special use permit conditions. Obviously, with special use permits, uh, the benefit is, is that there's usually some um, conditions that, that you can apply to that special use permit that are very specific to that application. Hence the reason why a lot of times the local laws that get rated for solar, they require the special use permit because of two reasons. One, you can condition it on certain things, but also it's a permit that's granted that can be pulled. And I think that's the benefit. Um, I haven't seen many where they had to be pulled, but, but it gives the municipality the authority to put some pretty stringent requirements on it. 
uh, specifically because it's transferable upon transferring of properties, as I understand it to be. Um, so a lot of times a special use permit for, let's say, um, somebody who wants to sell hats out of their house. Uh, if they sold their property to somebody five years after getting the special use permit, technically that person who bought a house has the same ability as the person that was previously there. Granted, following whatever protocol is required by your local law, but most of the time, a special use permit is transferable and then has to be renewed. Some communities require once every one, two, three years. Um, most of the communities have gotten away from that because it becomes a regulatory problem trying to track uh, special use permits. Who's got one? How did they renew it? They need to come in. They don't come in. What do we do? We got to go find them. And they don't, it becomes a headache because they don't have the staff to do that. So what happens is, is they give them their approval, maybe within a year, they renew it, depending upon there's no conflicts, no issues that came up to the review. And then they grant it for, for basically forever for as long as they're compliant with those conditions. Um, so sometimes you might have conditions on uh, what I call the statement of operations, which basically defines what that project is, how many employees, how many, um, what are your hours of operation, uh, where's parking, where's the trash receptacle areas, what's that process look like, what's the day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month, year-to-year operations look like for that business or operation, and then that usually gets approved with a number of other conditions. Sometimes it might be, this is a seasonal operation and therefore you have certain restrictions that they have to follow. Either way, a special use permit allows these boards to put conditions, very specific conditions on the project. Lance, we have a couple more questions. Yeah. Um, does the planning board review all the ZBA applications? So, a ZBA, earlier on, I referenced some of the, the advisory roles the planning board has. An advisory role they have in a lot of communities is on area variances. Um, some communities, because they don't have a staff in place, uh, may have the planning board be the initiator of the project. The project comes to them and they say, hey, yeah, you got everything. This is where it needs to go. You know, if the way, the way that I would recommend a process to work would be, it comes in and your CEO makes the determination, or your zoning officer, if you have one, makes a determination on where the project goes and it goes to that board. Um, it, it eliminates a lot of the, the feedback that doesn't need to have an unneeded delay, let's say, in the review. Now, if the ZBA wants to refer it to the planning board to get input because of whatever reason, cite the reason and refer back to the planning board so that they can give you input. I don't think that's a bad thing, um, but you, I think you have to have reasons that support that, that's all. Okay, and one other one, do you recommend a written findings of fact for site plan and subdivision reviews and why? I'm sorry, what was the first part of that, do I what? Do you recommend a written findings of fact for site plan and- Do I have written? Do you recommend a written findings of fact? Yes, okay, I got you. You're breaking up a little bit, I, I'm sorry. I got it though. Um, yep, okay. Um, a lot of the communities that I've seen do two things. There's some that are very thorough and they have what is identified as a findings of fact that supports whatever decision they make. Um, and those findings of fact are all their, their reasons supporting why it was approved. Um, a lot of communities I deal with also just have resolutions. And those resolutions basically summarize procedurally what occurred and then what conditions go on there. And then there's plenty that really just make the motion and it goes in the minutes. I would recommend having some documentation that goes into the file that says this is what took place and here's what the conditions were and why. Um, however you wanna call that, you can, if it's a findings of fact, call it findings of fact, but at least a resolution that identifies what was done and what the conditions are. Because I honestly, I believe there's conditions on every project, whether it's just getting signatures on the plan in that time frame, whether it's just making sure that all staff members have reviewed this and commented on it, even though you didn't get any comments, making sure that they are okay with it. I don't think that's a bad thing. 
Um, so I, I like resolutions. I think it, it kind of puts something for the file. Um, but I've seen some communities that do resolutions and then they have a, what is called a findings of fact behind it. I hope I answered that. That's all I have right now. Thank you. Okay. Um, what is the role of the ZBA planning board regarding special use permits? I kind of went over some of that. Um, mainly where, honestly, I, I like special use permits falling in the laps of the planning boards strictly. And, and I'll be on that. The reason is, is that most special use permits require site plan as a component. And the planning board is, is, is put together to review those site plans. They know what that process looks like and they're there to review that. Um, I feel like the uses that are associated with that can also be reviewed by them. And it, what it does, it does, it streamlines the process a little bit more. It makes it a little bit more complete. Um, but I, the, some of the better special use permit processes have one board reviewing it and it makes the most sense for the planning board because of the special, the site plan component. But like I mentioned earlier, the ones that have a two board review of special use permits, the ones that seem to do the best with their procedures are the ones that have been able to combine them where, where they can, either because neither one of them are that busy, and maybe they have one application that's going through, they've been able to put them together, advertise that they're together and going through the process one board at a time, but at the same night. And, and then that makes it a little bit easier. But, but the roles are this, uh, you know, is, is really that the planning board looks at the site components, the big picture uh, area to make sure all the components, is the driveway big enough to accommodate the parking? Is there parking? Is there any lighting improvements or sign improvements associated with the use that's being asked for under these special conditions? Some communities have very specific conditions in their code that says, hey, if you're gonna have a dog kennel, you need to have these elements incorporated into your plan. And then the planning board's job would be to make sure that those those items are in fact identified. And then the ZBA kind of goes through that use and puts whatever additional restrictions they feel are necessary on the use and granting of the special use permit. Um, but like I said, I, I, I tend to see that the, the, the better procedures are the ones where one board's doing, doing that review. Zoning Board of Appeals responsibilities, it's a, an appellate jurisdiction. You know, the ZBA exists primarily for its appellate functions in which it acts as a buffer uh, for aggrieved applicants between decisions of the code enforcement officer and the state Supreme Court. I mentioned earlier on that when you have an application come in, like in Canada, what they have a zoning officer who makes it, or excuse me, a code enforcement officer that makes a determination up front on an application and where it needs to go and whether it's deemed deficient. Um, sometimes that leads to exactly what it is the ZBA has to do. The applicant doesn't like the ruling that the code enforcement officer made and objects to it. And then that goes to the ZBA to make a decision. Does the ZBA agree with the ruling that the code enforcement officer made or do they agree with the applicant's decision or request for better understanding? And then they go through that process. Obviously the ZBA has other duties like use variance and area variance reviews, and then also for interpretation of the zoning regulations. Some communities just, the code enforcement officer either doesn't have the ability to do so, um, doesn't feel comfortable, or maybe it's written. I have a couple of communities where it's written into the code that even though they have a code enforcement officer who typically is the one to make those determinations, it's written in the code that their ZBA is to make those determinations. And so they cite the code section and they say, hey, is this use similar in nature to these other uses as identified in our code? And that would be up to the ZBA to make the determination for their code. Original jurisdiction, the ZBA uh, can be given original jurisdiction by the local uh, governing board, uh, like for special use permits and for site plans. I know there's some communities where uh, they've uh, abolished the planning board and it's strictly the ZBA because you have to have a ZBA for the appellate jurisdictional requirements and the interpretation of requirements. You have to have that ability. The planning board can't do that. So some communities have abolished the planning board and granted those site plan special use permit functions solely on the ZBA. Uh, variances. Use variances establish a use that isn't allowed. 
and area variances reduction in dimensional requirements, and that provides relief from strict law, from the strict application of the law. Um, use variances are granted by the ZBA, um, can also conduct interpretations if the applicant and the code enforcement officer disagree in understanding the definition of a regulation. So here's use variances, you know, the rule of thumb that I was always told, if you grant one use variance, you grant one too many. It's, it's, it should be difficult to get a use variance um, approved. And I know it happens in some communities probably more often than it should. And that usually means because your code is outdated. And, and I, from what I've learned is that a lot of times these codes, you know, even now, even the most up-to-date codes uh, year to year get outdated because of a new type of, of an application uh, that's permitted. Uh, most recently in New York State, is moving towards approving cannabis. So you already have another use that probably isn't identified in any code that I'm aware of, of a use that you might have to regulate. How do you do that? Um, Short-term rentals, that's another area where it's become more popular over the years, but it's probably not really thoroughly defined in your codes. Um, these are the areas where I would strongly encourage, if you, if you have too many use variances, coming in, it's probably because your uses identified in your code just aren't, aren't up to snuff at this point. You need to be reevaluated and, re, and, and enhanced so that you don't have that discrepancy. Um, also, the other option is, is try to get those interpretations done. Um, make your code enforcement officer, zoning officer, do interpretation that would prevent it from having to come in and get a use variance possibly. Maybe there is a use that's very similar in nature that can be approved by the ZBA, supported by the application, provided back to you guys, and then go through that process, as opposed to just calling it, oh, it's not, it's not in my code, it's not, and therefore uh, you need a use variance. Um, so I think those are the two ways that I've seen some communities approach it uh, when they're granting, prior to, prior to going through the, the use variance application process. Um, there's four criteria. Uh, in the use variance application, no reasonable return on property. Hardship is unique, will not alter essential character of the neighborhood. Hardship is not self-created. Um, those are very difficult to prove. And most times they're not, they're not all four of those criteria are being met. We have seen, again, back to the overall application process, we would suggest that those get provided into your applications for two reasons. One, the applicant is responsible for filling that information out, give you guys some information to review and look at to make that determination, but then reevaluate it as you guys review it as part of your review process. Area variance, definitely a little bit, you know, we see them all the time. Um, undesirable change to the neighborhood. Can an alternative be achieved? Whether a variance is substantial or not, negative impacts on the environment. Is it a hardship self-created? Again, these being included into the application, have the applicant complete them, and then the ZBA reviews them as part of the review. Um, a lot of times what we do is, you know, area variances, it's, they can be difficult at times, and sometimes they, they don't have to be. Uh, we encourage the applicant to do a couple of things. One, uh, is there any neighbors on the same street that have a similar uh, situation occurring? Take pictures. Uh, we support the applicant getting uh, feedback from the neighbors in support of the, the variance. Again, two things that you can use to help justify why the area variance was approved beyond these five questions that were provided. Um, some of the best practices, moving into the best practices and tools for you guys. Um, obviously, adopt a comprehensive plan, create a comprehensive plan, um, update your comprehensive plan. Um, if you have a comprehensive plan, it, it needs to, they're usually a 10 to 20 year outlook. Um, and then every 10 years, maybe even less, some communities I've seen every six, seven years are trying to update their, their comprehensive plan. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer as long as it's being updated. Um, and then because it, it, it's a reflection of what you got, it's your vision of what your community looks like. And it's not just your vision, it's, it's the community's vision of what the community should look like. And the way things are changing and the uses that are coming in, solar, cannabis, different type of areas, um, this helps support uh, and enhances the planning boards and ZBA's ability to approve projects 
when they go back and look at the, the comprehensive plan, which help guides those, those applications and tools. It becomes a litmus test for decision making. You know, does it fit with our comprehensive plan? Does it does our comprehensive plan show that we need to have um, more uh, mixed use residential areas? Um, is this the area for that? Uh, these are that's what a comprehensive plan helps us do and support in our decision making process. Um, some best tools that I've seen is also this is one community where all of their applications zoning code subsections, planning board calendars, top left corner, agendas, et cetera, were clearly identified in their offices. You know, I have a lot of communities that say, you know, it, it, it's one person's responsibility to wait on somebody and then go find them the form, hand them the form, and then they walk out. This takes some of that issue, some of that communication requirement out the door. It doesn't mean that you can't communicate, uh, it just, it lets the applicant come in, get what they, excuse me, feel is needed. It's clearly marked. These are complete forms. They have all the material that are needed in it and it allows them to go back. And then maybe if they have questions then, it makes it a little bit easier for staff to answer. Some additional tools. These are again, are, are just examples. Again, I use candidate when I apologize for that, but they have some really good application forms on their website. If you guys are ever, uh, in need of at least verifying what an application may look like. I would en encourage you to go to their website and take a look at their application forms. There's plenty of places that have it, but most uh, most regularly I work with them and I, I, know, I know that their forms are very, very thorough. In most cases, maybe too thorough, but at least for them, it has all the information that they're looking for. It has very clear uh, references on the front so the applicant knows what it is that they're grabbing. And then behind it, it has the calendar, it has a checklist, and signature forms, affidavit, it has all the information that you would require as part of that application. Some other tools that we've seen that could help through the process. <clears throat> if you have a, um, an overlay district that you want to encourage and protect, um, something like Farmington did with their streetscape overlay district, uh, they wanted to encourage uh, buildings closer to the road, parking in the back. They wanted to encourage walkability, uh, pedestrian safety, lighting. Uh, they wanted to encourage that village atmosphere where they don't have a village. Um, so they wanted to kind of encourage that over some of their corridor areas. And this was the way that they did. They adopted a separate plan um, that helps identify what those requirements are and what's expected of those applications that come in, which then in turn, help the planning board and or ZBA through the review of that application. Likewise, uh, many regulations. Um, other ones that I've seen have been where they pull them out of their codes and they make it what is called, what we call uh, the site design and development criteria manual. Basically what that is, it's just your specs so that every project that comes to you and once they get constructed are using the same materials that you previously approved as another project. It, it just makes everything the same and it doesn't require, you know, your DPW and your highway, your roads are always gonna come the way you want your roads to come. Your water main's always gonna come in the material that you want the water main to come. It's gonna be at a depth that you've permitted. Um, it, it's just, it's, takes that information and regulates it for all the board, for all the applicants to meet and then justify change if they're gonna change it. But it, it tells them what materials have been approved in your municipality and what's expected of them. We have a couple um, of- Before we go into questions, one more tool. Um, is we, it can be called many things. Uh, we call it a plan, plan review committee. For those communities that don't have a good, you know, a, a big staff, Kendigwas has a huge staff, Farmington has a big staff. Some of the cities that we deal with have big staffs where they have a lot of people in the office who are able to do many different roles. But those communities that don't, where they struggle is when an application comes in, how do we handle it? How do we process this? What we've suggest and what we've seen other communities do is they have this, this meeting. They call it a PRC meeting, as I said, uh, it could be a DRC meeting, a development review committee. It could be whatever you want it to be. Um, but the, the gist of it is, is 
that brings that code enforcement officer staff, maybe your DPW representative, maybe a board representative, maybe your consulting firm uh, engineer, maybe the county come in at one meeting at a table and you go over that, that application that you received. It's a, it's a way for an application that might be big. Maybe it's, um, it's got the potential to be, um, you know, concerning going down the line. Maybe it's a big phased project, a big commercial, maybe it's a solar project, I don't know. But maybe you want the ability to review it before it goes to that planning board and starts going through that process at a public meeting. Maybe you have the ability to meet behind the scene and say, okay, we have one board member, we have all the, the people who, uh, who have standing or, or some role in this review. What are some of the, the potential roadblocks that we see? Where does this need to go for review? Who has some concerns on it? It's just an opportunity to do that. And a lot of times, the more successful ones that I've seen have pushed that type of a meeting in the, in the beginning of the process before it goes to the plans, the planning board and or ZBA. Just a thought, um, I, I've seen that work and I've seen a lot of communities go that route and I think it's been fairly successful because um, it just gives an opportunity. And you know, there's no, there's no right or wrong way to do it. Um, you can invite the applicant to the meetings and have a powwow with them. Maybe it's your sketch plan review meeting where you have, you have a come in and discuss sketch plan. In either case, uh, I've seen those become very successful and help the planning boards and ZBAs get through the reviews because it's an opportunity to get some of these questions in the beginning as opposed to the middle of the process. That's what I have for you guys today. I don't know if there's any questions, Sarah, that we need to go through. Um, you have one. Would a SVU be appropriate for startups for Airbnbs? Um, yeah, I don't. I don't, I don't, I guess I don't know why it wouldn't be. And I, I, I mean, I've seen some communities where um, they may have written in these short-term rentals as a, a permanent use, but most communities have them as a special use permit. That way, if there's an issue with it, these short-term rentals, if there's an issue with it, or Airbnbs in this case, if there's an issue with it, they can pull the permit. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be forever. Uh, you know, if they're, if they're not following the protocol that you've approved them to the standards and that you're getting complaints, they, you then have a permit that you can pull from them and then they no longer have the ability to do that. So uh, yeah, I would encourage those type of uses to be identified as specially permitted uses. And then that way you can attach certain conditions to them because maybe there's certain areas where you don't want them. Okay, and then there was a, comment from the same that neither or RPS nor county have any standing on this. I guess I didn't understand the question. Can you say it again? It just, I think it's more of a comment than a question. It says neither ORPS nor county have any standing on this. Um, if you hit your little Q and A thing down down at the bottom, you can see what it says. Yeah, I'm going to it now. Neither O R P S nor county have any standing on this. I guess I don't know what this is is meaning. Um, uh, I know counties, a, a lot of communities do refer to the counties maybe for everything. And the county usually provides recommendations or helps them through the procedure. Um, they're a good sounding board um, to utilize. Uh, okay, I see what you're saying. There, there, I think there is no standard by the county for Airbnb. There may not be a standard yet for Airbnbs. I know there's a lot of communities, especially from communities that are dealing with these short-term rentals. And so what they've done is they put a moratorium on it. They've established a, a code or updated their code and created a procedure that they felt comfortable with. And then they implemented it. And that's what they, they have done. Um, I know counties are playing catch up in a lot of cases. Um, it's not like local, it's not like solar where they, they have a, a state ordinance that they can use to help guide you guys. In this case, there isn't one. So 
you're probably your best bet is to look up what other communities do, take other lakefront communities and verify what, what their short-term rental process and procedures are and use them and enhance them that fit what your guys' needs are. That's probably the best bet as opposed to relying solely on the county for information on that. Sarah, I don't, I'm not sure if there's anything else that we need to comment on. Oh, wait, there's another one. Uh, I can answer that one. About okay. Uh, thank you very much, Lance. I appreciate you pre presenting for us this afternoon. Um, and hopefully maybe you'll join us again in the future for uh, another training. <laughs> I, I do appreciate the opportunity to present uh, for Southern Chair West. And I do apologize for any of the hiccups that we had earlier on. Um, you would think this time, <laughs> by, the, by, by as often as we've all been using these type of devices, you would think we'd be better at it by now, but apparently I'm not. So I do appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much, Sarah. You did fine. Thank you, Lance. Okay. Have a good day. You too.